Hello and welcome to the Fresh Air Sci-Fi Show. I'm Joe. I'm Dave. And uh, tonight we're doing something a little bit different again. Uh, although carrying on in theme a little bit from the conversations that we've been having with uh, Bearded Heretic recently, we're going to be talking a little bit about the mind. I'm looking forward to it, Dave. I'm really looking forward to it, actually. Right. Yeah, so uh, Dave is going to be running us through uh, some stuff from Philosophy of Mind. Um, so, Dave, I mean, let, let's just start off. What actually is the Philosophy of Mind? Basically, the study of or looking at how to think about consciousness and how to think about what mind is and... Um, I mean, one of the most famous ones that most people hear think of is something like Descartes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, substance dualism, where the mind is a, a separate substance to physical. There's mental substances and physical substances. Um, but philosophy of mind has progressed far beyond that now, obviously. Um, so it's thinking about how the mind might come about. So is it physical thing um is it over and above the physical do we describe the mind phenomenally um do, is it ontologically physical and the physical creates this immaterial mental thing yeah i mean we we had a couple of uh thought experiments um a couple of months ago sort of dipping our toes into to this like uh whether the mind was purely physical or that sort of thing um so i mean how much of that is what we're going to be covering tonight none of it none of it oh excellent but so totally fresh that yeah that stuff does kind of relate to this and in future parts we'll be revisiting things like mary's room um but when you think about the mind it's good to get a grounding in what consciousness is or how we might think about it and look at it. Um, because that can help us to understand what mind might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. sounds awesome. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I believe you've actually got um, a little presentation for us. Did you, did you want to get into that now? Well, it's just a bunch of slides that have some points on it, mostly to help me remember what I'm talking about. Um, but also to help people sort of see and understand what I'm talking about. It's not very pretty. It doesn't look as good as your slideshows, but <laughs> it'll do. I spend too much time making mine pretty because I know there's no real substance to them. <laughs> <laughs> there's no it's real like, substance to mine either. It's, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, shall I quickly put us into Be Right Back and you can get it up so we can get it on? We were. <laughs>
Right, we're back in the room. Sorry that took a little bit longer than normal, guys. I don't know how to use technology. <laughs> Sorry, just saying hello in the chat. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, Luke, uh, I don't worry, dude. Um, I, yeah, I know you might not be able to stay the whole time. You're in the middle of cooking dinner, so I imagine you're going to have to go off. Uh, I'm fairly certain this probably isn't the sort of thing your partner is interested in watching. <laughs> I know mine <laughs> is not interested in anything I have to say on this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, Emma listens to me, but mostly just watches the telly while I blah blah. <laughs> so. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're we're going to be covering off um, philosophy of mind. This is going to be part one of what's probably going to be at least a three-parter, isn't it, Dave? That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes these things go on a lot longer as well. You know, there are times when we thought we were going to do one stream and we ended up doing three or four on the thing. So if this is planned for three streams, <laughs> expect It'll probably six. be... <laughs> yeah, it's like six months worth of stuff. <laughs> well, I thought it would just be one stream until I started putting it together and I realized, oh, shit, there's a lot to say just about consciousness itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It'd be interesting as well, actually, comparing anything like this to, to the conversations that we've had with, with uh, Bearded Heretic um, and, you know, the the crossover and if there's any differences. And... I, I know that you're not going to have the whole time um, to uh, listen to this, Luke. But if if you can give feedback and, like, say bits that, that you see differently um, or, or that is written differently or anything like that, again, like we did with the morality, finding the differences between the two um, and how, uh, like, morality is pr approached through psychology really interesting i expect this almost to be closer though uh to, to psychology than say morality is yeah that's my expectation I but, but i think neuroscience sort of feeds into how the philosophy sort of evolves and grows like if you think about descartes time he had no access to how the brain works and how it generates consciousness. So he had to devise it, it solely through deductive reasoning. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> but he had to devise it totally through experience yeah. rather than actual data. Whereas now you have people like Daniel Dennett and Patricia Churchland who use neuroscience and sort of contribute to neuroscience and use results from neuroscience to further develop ideas. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Although, oh dear, Dave, we just lost you. <laughs> Please let that be our technical glitch of the day. <laughs> no, he's, he's gone. <laughs> oh dear. Um, so I know you mentioned, uh, are you back? You're not back. He's still not back. Oh, there he is. We, that, I'm hoping that that's oh, going to be our, our fuck up of the day. You just disappeared there. You said, you know, you've got Daniel Dennett who <laughs> sort of just disappeared. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have people like Daniel Dennett and Patricia Churchland who use the findings of neuroscience, uh, yeah, neuroscience to further develop philosophy of mind. Um, and even people like David Chalmers use neuroscience to build on philosophy of mind and they too contribute to it in their own particular way and that helps develop and evolve the philosophy of mind interestingly though um daniel dennett is a i mean this is going slightly off topic uh, a compatibilist isn't he he is um but he uses neuroscience yet uh sam harris doesn't it is a determinist and he also uses neuroscience as well. Yeah. Because he's um, actually a neuroscientist, isn't he? As far as I'm aware, yeah. So, um, 
so no my, Sorry. my my question there is it is obviously they're 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 both using the same tool but coming up with a a different conclusion now i find um, a lot of sam harris's thoughts kind of flawed or contradictory with other thoughts that he has um so and also i do have a bias because i lean towards the same sort of position dennett does <laughs> so it's hard for me to be completely objective in this but um as they're both using the same tool but getting different conclusions i mean what would that really be um probably looking at the data slightly differently and also daniel dennett comes at it from an approach to do with dessert um things we deserve whether we can we deserve to be punished for wrong actions and for behaving immorally or committing a crime is it just to punish a person if they had no choice in the matter mm. so his is more of a, it's a balancing the idea of his moral thoughts with his thoughts on how we behave right yeah yeah that makes sense um, the other thing is, you know, Sam's just wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he uses sort of outdated findings, and I'm sure Luke would agree. I mean, Sam Harris uses sort of like the LeBay experiments and discusses how nothing in our conscious mind is comes from there. All of our thoughts and our desires exist. 500 milliseconds before we become aware of them. Um, and he uses just simple thoughts and simple desires to prove that. But as Luke said in when we had the discussion with him, that doesn't account for more complex decision making and com more complex processing. Yeah, and, and like we discussed, there is the, the conscious thought process can override the subconscious thoughts as well. Yeah. You know, so even if most simple things are somewhat determined, uh, like we did with the experiment of the Stroop, uh, the Stroop effect, you know, you had your instant response, but then you had your mind going, uh, no, that's not what you're supposed Hang to Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which showed a conscious override going over it. Um, I, I also find it quite interesting because Sam argues for an objective morality, but then says the universe is deterministic. Uh, like as in hard determinism, and it's like, so what do you mean by morality, Sam? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's sort of what Daniel Dennett is trying to overcome with the idea of compatibilism. Yeah, I mean, his, his compatibilism is sort of there is an element of free will to it, but it's sort of you're not, nobody's forcing you to make that choice. And you still have the conscious ability to override that choice when necessary. Yeah, makes sense to me. <laughs> but then, as I said, I do have a bias. Because... <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, and it... I'm sure there are others who have a bias the other way. I go, oh, you guys are just wrong as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, as long as we're aware of our biases... <laughs> I'm yeah. putting them out there. I'm letting you know that I am biased a particular way. So, you know, take that into account when you're making any decision on what I'm saying. I will do my best to present my bias to you so that you can do it. But if you're interested in my thoughts on free will, I've got an article called Free Will and Determinism on AnswersInReason.com. But enough of that. Let's get on with Dave's show. <laughs> okay. Um, so when we think of consciousness, we generally think of it in terms of us being aware of our environment, um, our emotions. We're, we're aware of, there's an inner awareness going on. Um, <clears throat> and we have an awareness of our mental states. We have an awareness, like it says on the card, of our perceptions, our sensations, our feelings. Um, and the conscious mind is considered all the mental activity that we're aware of. So yeah. when you look outside and you see the outside and you see the weather and you feel the pain in your knee, 
this is all the conscious mind. Yeah, and and like like we covered off before, it it there, there's a an internal awareness as well as an external awareness with with consciousness. Yeah, yeah, it, it's being aware of your own feelings or like when you wake up and you have I don't drink coffee, but um you wake up and you have that first cup of coffee and you smell it and you taste it and you sort of cherish the taste and the smell and it gives you a certain feeling that's the phenomenal consciousness going on mm -hmm. and that's generally how we think of consciousness and how it's thought of in philosophy it's to do with what we're aware of and um, so all the processes that go on in our brain that we're unaware of are subconscious or unconscious processing is is there a difference between subconscious or unconscious or is that just different labels for the same thing um well the, we're not aware of the activity going on in the subconscious or unconscious or however you want to describe it and that's the difference in the content um you wouldn't call it conscious mind if you're unaware of it yeah, I, it might but, contribute but sub, to the conscious mind. Yeah, but you're not conscious of it. But but both subconscious and unconscious, in terms of consciousness, are that basically the same thing. Um. Yeah, I'm using them interchangeably here yeah. because some people call it one, some people call it another. Generally, in philosophy, it would be referred to as the unconscious mind. Yeah, as a bearded heretic says, uh, they're the same. Um, unconscious is the updated term. Subconscious is Freudian. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, and obviously, <laughs> one of the problems with things like consciousness and con being conscious, I mean, that these words are polysemous as well. Yeah. Because, I mean, being conscious can also be being awake, but obviously... That isn't how it's being referred to here. Um, it is and it isn't. Um, uh, I'll be discussing that shortly. Um, oh, because that is, yeah, it is part of how we discuss consciousness. Mm -hmm. But when philosophers use the term, and philosophy of mind uses the term, it's generally speaking about awareness of our experiences our mental states our perceptions are like being aware of the pain in your knee the person calling you from the back garden that kind of thing and and in that notion that there, there may be i suppose certain creatures out there that we wouldn't say actually have consciousness or at least don't experience consciousness in the the way that that we do it's not as developed or anything like that so, some creatures when we say that they're conscious we literally mean that they're awake <laughs> rather than the developed consciousness that you'd be discussing through uh philosophy of mind well no it's still one of the things that's sort of in question is if a goldfish is aware of where it is not just awake but can see and process its environment and react to the environment, can we consider that conscious? It's, Does it, it have depends on how it's reacting, though, doesn't it? If it's doing it instinctively and it's being driven by the subconscious and all of the actions driven by automated processes rather than conscious processes... You know. Yeah, <laughs> Like I say, that that's part of the discussion that goes on in the philosophy of mind. Yeah. And we'll just go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that um, you mentioned there is, you know, if it's just automated processing, is it conscious? And does it have consciousness? Um, one of the things that people describe is qualia. You've heard that term before. Okay, and what qualia refers to is the distinct feel that we have in an experience. So, like when you listen to a good piece of music and it gets your head bobbing and you feel that groove, that's a sort of that's phenomenal 
phenomenal character of that experience. It has a certain emotion to it, and it gives us a certain feeling. There, there's something that it's like to feel that music and hear that music. Mm. Um, and some, some will argue that consciousness is that. It is being aware of that and having those feelings and those kind of awarenesses. Um, but people like Patricia Churchland and Daniel Dennett deny the existence of Qualia. Um, oh, really? That it's not, yeah. Um, that what it's not some phenomenal property that we're getting. It's memories of what it's like and um, it's us responding to the stimuli in a particular way rather than them having a particular feel. All right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that their stance is called the limited eliminativism in that they get rid of the quality altogether. There is no phenomenal character. There is no phenomenal properties. When you look at a tree, you're you might have a certain response to it, um, but that's only because you might have a memory of sitting under a tree and nostalgia comes in and it gives you a particular feeling about that tree, but you're not getting that from the tree. You're getting that from all your previous experiences. Okay. So what about when you experience something for the first time and you get that experience? Like, have you ever yeah, heard that... a piece of music for the first time and all your hairs have stood on end and you've just found it absolutely beautiful and you just can't help but be lifted away by the, uh, you know, the chord sequence and the lyrics and whatever? Yeah, I agree. I, I think quality exists. Um, but you could argue that the reason you're getting it from a new piece of music is because it reminds you of another piece of music and you like that piece of music and that influences your response to the new piece of music. Yeah, I mean, that's an obvious objection, but I don't think it's a good one. <laughs> I don't. Like I say, I, I think um, quality exists. I think there is something that it is like to experience mm. a piece of music or... They didn't feel the sun hit you on a summer's day, and it's not just a memory; it's an actual, it's a a part of that experience. Mm. Okay, so everybody's good with what quality are. You know, most people have heard the term, and they they sort of understand what it means. Yes. Yeah. Although I think okay. it's more fun to call it Qualia, because then you can think about quail. Yeah. <laughs> and Dan Quail, because he was quite funny. <laughs> and I'm older than everybody else, and nobody remembers who he is. <laughs> oh, although, I don't know, maybe Luke does. But he's really young. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he, well, he's going, yes! Um, but I don't know if that's in response to me saying Qualia, or... Uh... <laughs> well, or not? <laughs> uh, Leon says, "I think I understand Qualia." Um... Okay, Luke says he doesn't. Oh, well, it's alright. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Qualia is it basically comes from the Latin term to mean quality. So there is a certain quality to an experience. There is a qualitative feel to it. Um, it's sort of ineffable. We can describe what it's like for us to smell a cup of coffee. And we can use terms like soothing and things like that. But nobody else can have access to the way it feels to us. They have their own particular experience to the smell of coffee or the sound of Iron Maiden or the sound of a good Joe mix before. <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think a good one to to actually explain it with is color. Um, yeah. 
because that, is, that is sorry go ahead. i was gonna say that is one of the things that people use there's there's something that it's like to experience red and um, and we could both sort of describe our experience of what it's like to feel red or feel blue but that experience is unique to us um yeah. nobody else has that experience like when i see a color blue i might feel soothed or warmed as well as having the image that comes through to us of the color and you might find it cold or you know isolating we might even describe it in exactly the same way but still not be experiencing it the same way so what i was say showing there was obviously this is a, a red cable but to Dave, this red cable might actually look more like the green on this can. Um, and then you get someone who's colorblind, who just sees these two things as different shades of the same color. And equally, there are people with more cones in their eyes that see a much larger spectrum of color. And even then, we still don't know if the people with more cones in their eyes see things exactly the same as each other. So it's it's... It's talking about that subjective experience and, as you mentioned, like the way you might feel about the experience and so on and so on. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just, if you think of it in terms of like qualia is what it's like to feel that particular experience. Um, okay. So this moves on to sort of what you were saying where there's, there's different types of consciousness, different types of what it is to be conscious. So we might refer to somebody who's been knocked out by anesthetic as not being conscious. But we might also describe them as a conscious being because generally when they're not under anesthetic, they are conscious. Yeah. So an unconscious conscious being. <laughs> yeah. Um. So it, it is one of those words that can be used a multitude of ways. Like you say, it's a blissimous word. Um, and that even within that, there's a lot of different ways to use conscious and consciousness when we're describing the, either the being or the mental states or the processes going on. And in philosophy or philosophy of mind, there's two main terms that you can consider. One is called creature consciousness, and that's when we're discussing the agent or the being in and of themselves. So um, uh, when you're awake, you're conscious. Um, but there's also state consciousness, which is applied to the mental states that you have. So certain mental states can be considered conscious states. So experiencing your sadness can be considered a conscious mental state or if you have access to your mental state and those mental states influence how you think and might guide your experiences or your choices so there's inner inner consciousness and consciousness as a being so in those two th categories, there's also <laughs> several types of categories because that that's that's the way philosophy goes, really. And you know, it, these all sort of interrelate as well. So it might not just be one type of consciousness for a being. So the types of consciousness are sentience. Wakefulness, which is what you refer to when, you know, when you say a being might be asleep and we might not consider them conscious. Um, Self-consciousness, what it's likeness, subjective conscious states and transitive consciousness. Most of those are sort of self-explanatory, um, but I, I've gone through them and I've listed the different kinds. So sentience, most of us have some idea of what sentience is. It, it's being awake and being aware of your environment, being able to respond to it. Um, 
And that, that's what I mean when I refer to, say, the goldfish responding. There, there's a certain level of sentience to that goldfish. So can we consider them conscious simply by virtue of being sentient? I suppose that's... It, it's, it, it's more external awareness than internal awareness. That sort of... You're going for there? Yeah. Um, but a sentient creature is awake, aware of its environment, aware of things that might be dangerous to it, um, awareness that, that something's a food source. It could, it could have a certain inner awareness, like it feels hunger and knows that it needs to go and get food. So it has a certain level of inner consciousness as well. But not necessarily to the level of a not creature that we would say is is fully conscious. Speaking of consciousness, or self-conscious, yeah. So yeah. I mean, this, this is one of the things that I, I I always get confused between the two because whenever I read about sentience and consciousness, they both reference each other. <laughs> Yeah, because the words work in in this sort of way. Uh, so so sentience is talking definitely about an external awareness with varying degrees of internal awareness. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we can ask is, like it says on the side, what kind of sensory capacities would be sufficient for calling it conscious? And we might not be able to define these very well, or the, these kind of capacities might not be well defined. Like you might say, a goldfish isn't conscious. It might be sentient, but it's not conscious because it has no real understanding of what's going on. It's just reacting. Yep. But some might say, well, that's still conscious because it's awake and aware and responding. It, it has a, a. They wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> no, and it it has a basic level of intelligence. Yeah. Um. I mean, you think about a crow. Crows can puzzle solve. Yeah. Yeah. As as can octopi. Yeah. So, if they have no real inner experience, in the sense of self awareness and self consciousness they might still be responding to the environment in the same way that a goldfish does, but just with an extra level of intelligence around it. Would their not having that self-awareness and self-consciousness mean that they're not conscious? Depends on the definition of conscious, but I don't know is the answer either way. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's what this is saying. It's saying, you know, we could consider them conscious and having consciousness simply by virtue of being sentient, but it might be hard to do to actually define all that and what is the minimal level that would give us cause to call it conscious and say it has consciousness. Yeah, as Luke says, it's like what point do we put a value judgment on? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I suppose it's and... like like Martin's sort of theory of of personhood. Probably all yeah. these things that go like the building blocks of it, but they're all certain things that you might have, and some things might be mostly there. Some things might be all the way there. Some things might only have a couple of features. Yeah, and at what point is the minimal level of features that allow us to call something conscious? or say it has consciousness. Mm. Like, if we took, for example, a computer that was capable of processing its environment, responding to its environment, um, reacting to it, say, protecting itself, um, like, imagine a, a little Roomba thing. Yeah. You know, the Hoovers. Yeah, yeah. They I'm respond to the environment. Like <laughs> yeah, they'd be very handy. Um, but they respond to the environment, um, they react to it, they process it, but I'm not sure I would call it conscious. No, I wouldn't at all. 
No. Um, so there's a certain level of inner experience that comes with that reacting to the environment. So if, if like the crow is actually seeing its environment and processing it and having an experience of it, we could then add, we could then say, is it conscious? Yeah, fair. Um, and here's, you know, the obvious one that wakefulness. Um, and this goes back to what you say, where if something's awake, we generally call it conscious. Yeah, but not necessarily that it has consciousness, consciousness. or at least <laughs> depending on that value judgment, like like bearded heretic says, you know, just because it's awake or just because it's conscious doesn't necessarily mean it fills the parameters for consciousness. Yeah. Look at um, jellyfish, they don't even have brains and they're awake. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and and that again, it shows that there is a certain amount of processing of the environment that comes that sort of has an inner experience, even if it's not a qualia-like experience. We still expect a certain level of intelligence and ability to process a certain type of ability to process this environment before we can consider it conscious or having consciousness. And the, the reason we would use wakefulness, I guess, is because we might say that the agent is conscious and that's their general sort of demeanor. They generally have consciousness. It's when we remove it that they become unconscious. But we have that distinction because generally we consider them as being conscious. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Okay. I I can't see my Discord, so I, I I'll have to check occasionally. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I was just I was I was nodding along and thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's dangerous. <laughs> Look where it's got me. Old and senile before my time. <laughs> Did you see that recently? Um <laughs> that using your brain too much can actually reduce your lifespan. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, that explains why I feel like I'm 80 and I'm only 50. <laughs> the, I, I, I haven't verified uh, the, the study. I just saw something go by and I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> no wonder philosophers die young. <laughs> <laughs> well, most don't. They live to old, old age. So does that mean philosophers aren't truly thinking? <laughs> or it just means the thing I saw earlier was absolute bullshit. Um, which yeah, is probably likely like... because I saw it on the internet. <laughs> yeah, but we're on the internet. Yeah, so, so it's we're absolute saying bullshit. bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so here is self consciousness. Um, is this a property that a being must have before we can consider it conscious? I mean, most people know what we're referring to when we say self consciousness. It's not just awareness that they exist in some way, it's not just being aware that you're hungry or anything like that. John Locke describes it as a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it. Oh, no, we've lost you, Dave. Um... <laughs> and, and you're back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. I just, put, I just put some music on whilst you froze there. <laughs> ah, sorry. Did you get any of that? Uh, you said John Locke describes it a thinking, intelligent being. Oh, oh, and we've lost you again. Being that has reason and reflection. <laughs> I don't know what's going Am on. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Oh, hey, Hello? Jess, how are you doing? <laughs> Glad you can join us. We're, we're currently doing uh, Philosophy of Mind, but um, just had a couple of connection issues. 
surprise, surprise. <laughs> Okay. Am I still here? You are still. Oh, yeah. No, maybe. <laughs> uh. Okay. Yeah. So John Locke describes self awareness, self consciousness as a, a being is self conscious if it's a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking. Yeah. So if if you can imagine yourself in danger or on a beach soaking up the sun, or you can imagine what it might be like to be old and or think about yourself in a future time, you have a certain sense of self consciousness. Yeah, and I think I'd agree that that something needs this self conscious I was saying like self awareness, um and, and these thoughts and reflections on the on things. I think that is something that I, I for me to regard something as fully conscious, I think it needs that. I can understand that maybe something can be described as having a type of consciousness, or something can be described as being conscious because it's awake. But for me, I think self-consciousness is a cornerstone of something to, to be described as a creature with consciousness needs to have okay uh, i mean there there is a lot of people that would consider that as well um and i sort of agree but i still lean towards a more simplistic version of consciousness as being awake being aware of the environment the ability to process the environment it's just that there are higher levels of consciousness like josh wink said that's interesting because I mean you 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 took a a very different view on the on personhood. You wouldn't have differing levels of personhood. You saw that in a very binary way, but you've gone the other way on this one. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I don't want to detract from it. I mean, if you want to know a bit more about personhood, there's a podcast episode on our. Uh, and tonight's not about personhood; it's about consciousness. So I shall shut up and let Dave carry on. <laughs> um. But. You know, the self-consciousness is one of the ways that we discuss consciousness in philosophy of mind. Um, is this a necessary property for something to be considered conscious or having consciousness? And like you said, it is one of the things that you would consider a necessary property. Yeah, for so something and there, to be there is no right or wrong in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the next one is what it is likeness. And this sort of refers to qualia. And it comes from Thomas Nagel originally, from his paper, What It Is Like to Be a Bat. His, he aims more to capture consciousness as the idea of subjectivity. So a being is conscious if it has a subjective experience of the world. So if there's something that it's like to be that being, then we can consider it conscious. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm just thinking about oh. um, what what is it like to be a bat? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's it's something that's ineffable to us yeah. um, because we can't imagine what it would be like to be something through, through echolocation. Mm. And, and it's we can things, examine even the if brain. We could transfer our consciousness to a bat. It would still be our consciousness processing the bat's perception anyway, wouldn't it? So it yeah. would still be our experience of the bat's experience rather than the bat's actual experience of everything it's doing as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what it is like in this consciousness, it, I think there is something to that as well. Um, so there is something that it's like to be a goldfish, a bat, a, a crow, a human, and for me, if there's something that it's like to be that, and there is a subjective experience going on, I would consider that a conscious being, a being with consciousness. 
Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, I suppose it depends, though. If, if say, for example, the goldfish doesn't actually have any self-awareness, I'm, I mean, saying if, I don't know, but say, say it doesn't have any self-awareness and it's purely reaction-based, you know, um, and it, it's not processing anything consciously, it is all subconscious process, is there really any experience that it's actually having? If if it has a particular way that it sees the world, um, so if you imagine a dog, they see using a different spectrum. Mm-hmm. So there is something that it's like for them to experience the world. Yep, I they they I I would also say that they do have a form of consciousness because of the way they interact, understand things, have. A certain amount of self awareness, but not in the say not to the same level as maybe a human. Um I, I think with a dog it's it's easier to do it. I think with something like a especially a goldfish, um, but you know, most forms of fish their their experience seems very limited. So But there I is want... still something that it's like to have that experience. Yeah, I mean, we'll, they, we'll go with it. <laughs> yeah, they there is some they they see a particular way, they react a particular way, they have a particular kind of experience of the world. It differs from ours. There is a subjective point of view from their experience. Yeah, I mean, that's the bit that I'm wondering about is if they actually have that subjective point of view, um, or if it is more. I, so go, going back to um, the the jellyfish that that has no brain, I mean, surely that's pure reaction. Then there is no subjective point of view in that regard, is there? I would say there is, and um, even if they don't think about it, that they're alive, they feel pain, they might feel fear, even if it's just a reaction. Um, there might be some kind of subjective feeling that they have that we don't have access to. Uh, fair enough. Hard for me to imagine not having a brain. I mean, I'm brain dead yeah. a lot of the time. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but it's hard to imagine not having a brain. Um, and it's, yeah. I, um, I mean, I think, I think again, looking at the chat, uh, Philip would agree with you. Uh, and say if it's like something to be X, then I would agree that X is conscious. Um, yeah, no, and that's fair. It's it's. I guess it comes down to to whether you see it as as binary or as um, a spectrum. And if you see it as a spectrum of consciousness, then I'd agree that there is a certain amount of consciousness there. But I would I would put it very far down this end to in comparison to being way up there for a, for say a fully conscious being like a human or um, some other apes um, things like that. Yeah, and and that that is the question is what is sufficient um, and what is necessary for us to be able to call something consciousness? And this is you know this is what the debate is about. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I need to just switch my mind to thinking about it in a spectrum rather than thinking about it in a binary format. Well, one of the things is we only have access to our own consciousness. And we only know what consciousness is like from our own feel of it. So if we consider ourselves conscious and having consciousness... When we consider a being that doesn't have the same kind of awareness and feeling that we do, we might consider it not having consciousness because our experiences are what we consider to be consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So, as with everything, there's a personal bias there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh. (laughs) Okay. And the next one is being a subject of conscious state. Um, So 
this means that we would discuss an agent as having consciousness if they have certain conscious states. Um, in other words, if they have mental states that we would consider to be conscious states. And as with anything else, um, like with sentience, you know, what, what counts as sentient? When can we say something is sentient? The same goes for mental states that we consider to be conscious states. How do we define a mental state as a conscious state? Um, we would have to define that and then define a being as having consciousness if it has those or capable of those particular mental states. Yeah, I mean... This is one of the things why I sometimes get confused between consciousness and sentience, because when I look into things like child development, um, obviously in the womb, they become conscious. They gain sentience when they're born, and then their consciousness starts developing from around five months. <laughs> And yeah. when it's talking about the consciousness there, it's talking about the self-awareness and things like that, all that additional stuff on top of it, above sentient. And I think that is one of the things that has always thrown me off with the the, the consciousness versus um, sentience discussion, because they're conscious, then they're sentient, and then their consciousness starts to form. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but... I mean, if the baby is responding to stimuli, um, is it still conscious? It depends like, even on the version not... of conscious you're stating Yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> and this is the debate, you know, what what is the minimal thing needed to be able to consider something as conscious? What can we argue for? What can we find from neuro, uh, neurobiology? neuropsychology and all that kind of thing how can we combine that into understanding what consciousness is yeah yeah no no, no I'm, I'm with you there um I, like i was saying with the with the babies that they say that their their consciousness starts to, to form uh around five months i mean it's they don't regard their consciousness as fully developed until they're about three years old and then We've had plenty of conversations about the brain development and actually how critical thinking skills and stuff like that. I mean, your brain isn't fully formed to start processing this information. It's stuff you learn over time. So these are the additional things on top of when when things are regarded as, at least from human terms, fully conscious, uh, con as in having that consciousness, not just the wakefulness state. <laughs> that we'd then say are uh, like consciousness plus <laughs> and it, yeah uh, and it's... that could be a good way to look at it consciousness plus i mean if you think about the baby before it's developing the kind of consciousness that you speak of it is still experiencing the world in some way which is why it's even sentient. if it... <laughs> yeah so is sentience enough for consciousness <laughs> <laughs> and you know like nagel argues if there is something that it's like to be that being even if it isn't particularly aware of itself there is still something that it's like to be that being so i would consider it as having consciousness yeah uh, especially if you put it in that sort of spectrum and if you i suppose there's going to be almost a, a general order of operation and the first one would be being awake <laughs> in in that sense um or the ability think, to be awake <laughs> well be... think of it this way if you threw water on the baby would it feel that wetness in general i would say yes so wouldn't even if it couldn't understand that it was wet or what had happened it would still have a particular feeling from being wet but wouldn't you consider that conscious and having consciousness? Even if the, even if they're unaware of everything, that there's still this feeling and experience? From the spectrum state, yes, 
I wouldn't say it would have it had full consciousness, but if we regard it as a spectrum, then yes, definitely. Um, it's just one of those. It's like I was saying, like if we regard you either have full consciousness or you don't, then no. But I prefer viewing it as a spectrum anyway, because I think most things should be seen as a spectrum, because it's the building blocks that lead up to fully conscious. It is part of consciousness. Well, when you say fully conscious, couldn't we just describe it as a different kind of consciousness? Yep. Rather than something has minimal consciousness or full consciousness, there's just different states of consciousness. Yep. Of course you could. You could describe it as anything you like. I mean, you know, free speech, man. Yeah. (laughs) Go away, Chris. Uh, Yeah. That might be quite tenuous. I do apologize to our viewers out there that have no (laughs) idea what that conversation was about. (laughs) But yes, you're, you're right. It could be regarded as different forms of consciousness. Um, I will concede to that, yeah. Fair. Yeah. So it's just a rather than a spectrum, it's just different states. Yeah. Okay. And the next one is what's known as transitive consciousness. And th- this is the final one when it comes to creature consciousness. And when we speak of transitive consciousness, what we speak about is that the consciousness has intentionality. And what that means is that it's directed at something. So we have consciousness of, I'm looking out my window now and I can see clouds in the sky. So my consciousness is directed at those clouds and we are conscious of those clouds or I'm conscious of those clouds. So consciousness might need a particular sort of intentionality. It might need content. And that that is in contrast to intransitive, intratransitive, in that we can be aware of our own experiences. So... Is a really simplistic way to put this as like external awareness of intent, or is that is that missing the mark? No, yeah, sort of missing the mark. Um, just it's directed at something. You can say they might be aware of something, but they don't have consciousness of something unless it's directed at that thing. Okay. So consciousness needs content. It's not just the state of pure consciousness. Being, having it, it, there's something that it's like to be that being might not be enough. They might need to also be able to focus that consciousness on something and be aware of that thing and understand that thing. So sort of, uh, there's this thing over there it looks like a tree. It's probably a tree. I'm going to walk towards that tree. Yeah, something like that. Um, so it just being in your field of vision isn't enough to say that something has consciousness of that tree. They, yeah. they need to have a perception of it and be able to focus on it and things like that. Uh, so be, this goes be aware of you... the tree, Enos. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So this would go back to your... Um, objection to the goldfish where they're just reacting to things they might not necessarily be able to focus on anything or be conscious of a particular thing they're just responding to stimuli there's a thing there's a thing there's a thing there's a thing these things probably in my way so i'll move yeah rather than ah, well i you know consciously aware of oh well if i do this then that yeah okay yeah no Uh, that, that makes more sense I don't particularly think that consciousness needs content as such, not in this sense. Um, like I say, I, I generally tend to go with Nagel's idea. Yeah, that's fair. Um, 
Do you have time for uh, me to catch up on the chat and read out some comments? Yeah, of course. So, um, Luke says, if something had no awareness of its sensory input, then would it be like anything to have its experience? So that's in reference to to the whole like something from a couple of slides ago. So the the, the qualitative experience of, of say being the, the goldfish or whatever, um, if it has no actual awareness and it's purely reactive, would it have that experience of be like? Well, yeah, because again, um, it might process the stimuli a certain way, and it might. It's the fact that it can see something and that seeing something creates that processing. So there is still something that it's like to be that being. But is it any different, say, from a camera with motion detector going? Yeah, because there's a certain inner experience going on, even if. Even if they're not particularly aware of it, there is still an inner experience going on. Like that, I would imagine a goldfish can feel pain. So there is something that it's like to be that being if it can feel pain or fear or what have you. It, yeah, it all depends it, it on how you're aware of its feelings. That that's that's yeah, the bit yeah. I'm I'm the awareness side of it that I think I am personally getting stuck on. You know, if it's is it aware that it's say feeling the pain or is it reacting to something that its brain says to react to and there's no actual awareness there yeah um i think that's a tricky one i would go with yes because there is still a certain even if they're not aware of how they're seeing something they're still seeing something a particular way like go with the bat example imagine the bat ran purely on instinct but it sees the world a particular way. It uses echolocation. So there is still something that it's like to be that bat and process the external environment. And it sees a particular way. It hears a particular way. So, so it not, has it's not a zombie. Yeah, yeah, basically. There, there is still a certain level of inner experience going on. It might not be fully fully aware or anything like that but as long as it has some sense of feeling then i would say that there is something that it's like to be that bad i mean as philip says you have to be aware of something to have an experience but you don't need to be aware of your awareness of something <laughs> yeah. yeah you don't need a mental state about that mental state in order to have that mental state <laughs> Uh, just to confuse things <laughs> no 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 i mean it, it makes sense just because i know how balmy you are um... <laughs> <laughs> i'm going <laughs> um so uh three vikings hey how you doing by the way nice to have you here uh says uh if something can respond to stimulus it is aware of it can it interpret interpret the stimulus and that's different um so that that does make um a lot of sense in, in, in that regard like it can respond to the stimulus so there is a certain awareness of it like philip was saying they might not be aware of their awareness but there's still the response there but whether it can interpret it and that's going on to the the goldfish example like you mentioned there as well with this transitive consciousness the, the the goldfish might not have the transitive consciousness that we were, were speaking of, yet it would still have some form of sentience, which is another form of consciousness or part of consciousness. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Luke, have yourself a good one, dude. Uh, I will catch you soon. Um, look forward to, to having you back as well, because... Uh, we got we got lots to discuss on the whole consciousness front. Um, so trying to catch up on everything, I do apologize. Uh, uh, Luke also said, "Does it have to be aware of it? Plants respond to stimulus, but they are aware they're responding to stimulus." So Philip responds saying, "I don't think that 
they are aware that they are responding to stimulus. And I think you're right there. But it's more an interesting question of if it's like something to be a plant, if uh, if you're aware of stimulus. So I think what they're talking about there is plants um, can sort of sense when they're being eaten and slowly retract away from it. And there are certain plants that sort of open with the sunlight and close as it goes away. So they are responding to stimulus as well. So they don't necessarily have awareness of their awareness. But from what we've just said, they are responding to stimulus, which would, by what we've said, mean that there is a certain awareness going on. Yet I don't think we'd regard most plants or any, maybe, of being uh, uh, conscious, would we? No, but is there something that it's like to see like a plant or hear like a plant or feel like a plant? Well, uh, they don't have eyes as far as we're aware. <laughs> um, I think the only sense that they have is that feeling because they do respond to being eaten. So there is a form of feeling there. Um, it's not how we would understand feeling. But the fact that they can respond to stimuli, the fact that they can respond to this, surely it means that they have it there. I'm not sure about that. No? I mean, is it, is it just an, a natural reflexive response, or is it a feeling that they have that drives that response? I mean, what's the difference between them and uh, a you know, a biological creature, a non-plant-based creature, you know. Um, the jellyfish, going back to them, they don't have the brain. Like, what's the difference between a plant and a jellyfish in that regard? Uh, I must have misunderstood one of your previous statements then. Because um, I wouldn't say that there's something that it's like to be a jellyfish. I must have misheard one of your oh, things. Oh, okay. Okay, no, that, that's fair. So you wouldn't you wouldn't regard uh, a jellyfish as having consciousness? No, no. Okay, fair. Uh, I mean, that could have been my misunderstanding as well. I thought that you said that they would have that sort of experiential thing going on. Um, ah, no, sorry. I, I thought um, I must have misheard you and thought you said goldfish because we were talking about the goldfish. Ah, okay, okay. So that's that that clears something up. So um, there isn't. Uh, so uh, a, a a jellyfish you wouldn't regard as having consciousness. It has no brain. It reacts to stimuli in the same way that a plant reacts to stimuli. But it doesn't actually have any form of awareness in the way that we'd regard something with a brain to have that sort of awareness, even if yeah, they're not aware of their awareness. Yeah, I wouldn't say a jellyfish has sentience. Okay, cool. The jellyfish doesn't even have sentience. Would you say that a jellyfish has any form of consciousness from the ones that you've described tonight? Uh, no, because I think a brain is necessary for consciousness. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. I just wanted to, to clarify that. Um, so that that makes some of my confusion earlier on makes sense a hell of a lot more now <laughs> yeah sorry my mistake my mistake <laughs> um so uh, carrying on with the chat um three vikings says it depends on the interpretation of aware plants respond to being eaten and warn other plants um but he wouldn't say plants are aware any more than uh phytoplankton or a goldfish so he uses the goldfish in that example so he would say that the the level of awareness between a goldfish and a plant is the same. I suppose your difference there, though, Dave, is the the fish has a brain, and the fish has more sensory interpretation in the terms of sight and and smell and taste and things like that. Even though it may be very rudimentary. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. So it's still a different qualia. Or qualia, yeah. as I like to say. <laughs> yeah. The goldfish is experiencing the world. It sees the world. It hears... Well, I don't know if goldfish can hear, but it might feel vibrations and 
be aware of those vibrations and those vibrations cause a reaction um, it, it and has it, an experience of the world whereas the plant literally is just reacting yeah yeah it's not experiencing it's pure reaction yeah that if is an interesting consider... distinction yeah think of something like a goldfish is having pure consciousness it's just it's existing it has a subjective viewpoint of the world in that it can see it and it can process it what it's seeing it might not have content it might not have the kind of awareness you might expect but there is still something that it is like to see like a goldfish but you can't say the same for a plant yeah <laughs> Uh, the chat actually goes on discussing this um, quite a fair bit. So I'm going to skip this because I think that you uh, have, have addressed everything that's been said in the chat past here. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Philip brings up uh, panpsychism. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's there's a little bit of consciousness in everything, isn't it? Um, it's that consciousness is a fundamental particle of the universe, sort of. It's a fundamental feature of the universe. So it's not necessarily in every atom, it's just part of the universe in itself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or you could even argue, that even if you argued that it's in every atom, there is a, you know, there is a certain level of consciousness that is in each atom as a fundamental thing that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is conscious yeah no i i mean that's 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 the version of it i've i've discussed with people before that there is this certain type of consciousness in like this tiny little bit in absolutely everything um which is interesting because i mean as a kid you imagine your toys being alive and things like that. And it's if panpsychism is true, then that means that's kind of right, and that toy stories is more horrifying than we realize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry for going off again. <laughs> it's all right. Um. So, uh, carrying on, at what level does something qualify as a brain? Is it enough to be able to react to stimuli? I mean, from that front, there's there's a ton of neurons in your stomach. So, from from that perspective, is your stomach a second brain? I mean, that would make mean that men have three brains. That's crazy how dumb we are with three brains. It's because our little brain has the most control. <laughs> <laughs> um, Free Viking says he's not sure. In biology, it's a larger mass of neurons than elsewhere in the organism. So, I mean, does that mean that something can only have one brain by, by that? Because that's not true in biology, because there are some things that have... Aren't there? Or am I thinking hearts? I think I might be thinking multiple hearts rather than multiple brains and that. But I'm sure there's organisms somewhere that have more than one brain. Um, but yeah. Siamese <laughs> twins? Sorry? Siamese twins? Yeah, yeah. And Siamese t twins, two organisms or one? Well, they're connected. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you're supposed to say Siamese anymore, are you? It's conjoined. I don't know. Conjoined I, twins. Then. Yeah, I mean, I get I get confused with these because there's certain things that I've learned growing up. For example, Chinese whispers, um, but you're not supposed to call it that anymore either. But no one's told me what you're supposed to call it instead. All I know is that in America they call it the telephone game, but they don't call that it that over here. So how can I communicate what they'd call it over here and have people understand? Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Philip says we should have Emerson Green on because he's a panpsychist. Ooh. 
I like uh, Emerson, actually. He seems like a good guy. Yeah, yeah, he's really cool. He did a great video on defining atheism and agnosticism and the four quadrant um, graph recently, and it was really good. Uh, did he point out how it's all wrong? <laughs> sort of, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he did it in a really nice way as well. Yeah. I, I doubt he's, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> Um, he debated T jump not long ago as well. Oh, uh, really? And as he stated, it turned into a dumpster fire. Well, anything. I've never actually dumpster, seen him it? lose his. Yeah, I've never actually seen Emerson lose his temper, but he did with that one. Yeah, but there are certain people that can really drive you to it. Yeah. And shit, I've just noticed a spelling mistake in my slide. Well, it's all right. I'm I'm dyslexic, so chances are I won't notice, and we can pretend everyone else is too. Okay. <laughs> so, as stated previously, um, there's also the idea of state consciousness. Um, so, if certain mental states could be considered conscious states, um, so then we would have to decide which mental states would constitute a conscious state. And some of the ideas that are in philosophy of mind are a state one is aware of, qualitative states, phenomenal states, what it is like states, two spelling mistakes, damn it, <laughs> access consciousness and narrative consciousness. So the, those are the kind of mental states that are mostly thought of as conscious states and of course there's still debate between what counts as one and what is sufficient to be counted as those things so a state one of one is aware of this defines a conscious state simply as mental state that the agent is aware of being in so if you have a mental state about being hungry. So you have a mental state where you're hungry and you're aware, you have a mental state that makes you aware of that. Then we might consider that as being a conscious state, not the mental state of feeling hungry, but the mental state of knowing that you're feeling hungry. Or the mental state of hearing music but also a mental state of knowing you're hearing the music, being aware of feeling the music, and aware of feeling the music, say. Yep. That makes a lot of sense to me. Why I was quiet. Sorry, I didn't have anything to interject. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th that that would be considered one mental mental conscious state. And I, I suppose this one is sort of linked to a what it is like state. Yeah. So you have your mental state of what it is like is the conscious state. So qualitative states. The, this idea defines conscious states as those that involve qualia. You're right. Yeah. Fine. Oh, I just heard a click. Sorry. Apples. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> So a state can be defined as a conscious state if there is particular feeling to that mental state. So again, if you have a particular feel to smelling the cup of coffee, tasting the cup of coffee, and that, you know, th those mental states are caused by you drinking the cup of coffee, then you could be said to have a mental state that is a conscious state. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's sort of similar to the one before, but adds on that distinction that you're not just aware of it, there's a certain feel to it. So the next one is phenomenal state. Um, so you can consider this one to be similar to the qualitative state. So 
you not only have a particular feel to it and a particular sense of what it's like, but you are also aware that you're sat at a table, you have a cup in your hand, cup is warm, um, you're in a certain place in a certain time. The whole experience itself is needed to be able to count it as a conscious mental state. I, yeah, okay. And again, this... Sorry. I was going to say, that sort of goes against what you said before, really, doesn't it? Yeah. But again, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to this. I, I think this counts as a mental state, but I think it's over and above the what it's likeness. Yeah. So it's not that this... This is a necessary state for something to be considered conscious. It's just that this could be considered a conscious state. Okay. And I think that that's one of the ideas is. Is one of these necessary for it to be considered conscious or is it just sufficient? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does that make I, sense? Oh no, no, it definitely does. I think it's it, it's like I was saying before. There's like a spectrum, but are any of the things absolutely necessary for it? And I'd say being awake is the one that is definitely necessary. You could still be yeah. a conscious being that's asleep, but I mean having the ability to be awake rather than actually being awake at the time. Um, so something that has the ability to be awake um, is the the necessary bit, and the rest of it, I if we're taking the spectrum in, the rest of it is all different building blocks that sort of fill up the category. And then, like we said earlier, you've got your point where you've reached consciousness, like full consciousness, and then you've got consciousness plus, which is all the additional things that can add to the conscious experience. That yeah. are not required for any of the bit before. Yeah. And that, like you say, that you could consider it a spectrum, but I just consider it different states, although I suppose that's describing the same thing, just using different language. Yeah. Okay. Um, what it's like state. This is linked to Nagel's idea of creature consciousness and what it's like. So a mental state might count as conscious if that mental state creates the, the what it's likeness for that being. So if it if the mental state creates a sort of first person view of the the environment that it's in then that mental state could be considered a conscious state. What if it produces a third person view? <laughs> See a doctor. <laughs> because you're probably suffering from some kind of disassociation. <laughs> yeah, fair. So the, the, yeah, does that one make sense as well? It does, it does. Um, no questions on that one from the chat at the moment either, so... I think it's making sense oh, okay. to everyone. I hope so. I'm not <laughs> the, like I said before. The philosophy of mind is probably my weakest subject. So, a good one for us all to brush up on and contest. Yeah, um, I'm. I'll probably be a bit better once I've brushed up properly again. This is mostly going on memory and quick skims of the material. Okay, um, so access consciousness, and this, again, is a mental state form of consciousness. So in this sort of conscious state consciousness, it's the ability, ability to interact with the mental states. So if the agent has access to the content of that mental state, so you have access to your sight, 
and that site can help guide your decision on whether or not to stop before you hit a wall. Right. It there doesn't necessarily need to be a certain feel to it. You just have to be able to access it. Yep. Um, or say access a memory that helps you make a decision about who you vote for. Fair. Um, I suppose you could sort of count feeling your heartbeat because that's access to a mental state. It gives you access to a physical state. Yeah, I think it's easier to just put it in 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 the more simplistic terms. Like you started with, like your site. Oh, look, there's a wall in front of me. I should walk around it. Yeah, or say you hear a loud bang. Yeah. You have access to that sound, and you can process it and understand what it is. It, it's some basically screaming downstairs, and you decide to go down and invest. or put your phones in. <laughs> yeah. Um so yeah that that's what state consciousness is it's being aware of your mental states and being able to access them and process them and use them to guide how you go narrative consciousness and this is something that sort of daniel dennett kind of uses so if we consider a stream of consciousness, so our whole experience of everything is a stream of consciousness. We have stimuli coming in, we see the world, we hear the world, um, and it gives an ongoing sort of story of our experience or a narrative of our experience. And the mental state, so our if we access our perception, that would be considered a, a sort of a mental state because we have access to that stream of consciousness. And that mental state could be considered a conscious state. Yep. <laughs> yeah? Yep. <laughs> okay, and we're pretty much at the end. Um, so it, it was quicker than I thought it would be. So that all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's what my missus says every night. She usually boils an egg by it. Okay. So when we think about consciousness, a lot of these ideas might appear to be exclusive. Like you might think I have to adopt one of these at the exclusion of all the others. But that's not necessarily the case, as we've discussed. There are different ways of thinking about consciousness and sufficient conditions and necessary conditions. And some of them kind of work together. So like Nagel's ideas kind of work together. And the stream of consciousness could sort of, in the state consciousness, could also be considered to be part of the what it's likeness that Nagel describes. Uh, yeah. Um, so you don't necessarily have to adopt one. You could go with your idea that there is a, a spectrum of consciousness ranging from being awake to having awareness, self-awareness like a human does. All these things kind of work together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe my view on it is a bit too simplistic. Um, but I, I think if we, like we do with personhood, you know, we use ourselves as a baseline. And I think if we do that with consciousness, we use ourselves as a baseline. And I understand what you're saying. Like there's different types of consciousness that, that, that fit in, but those different types of consciousness could all fit in. And I think we'd say that a human has all those types of consciousness. So that's why we've got, you know, from being awake up until this point where we've got everything. And there are other creatures that say only have a couple of them. So they do there. Now they may have these two or they may have these two, whichever it is, it's it sort of filled in. Although I think that you would generally find 
a certain order of operations that this spectrum would would fill up with creatures and their their maximum capacity of consciousness anyway yeah at least in general and yeah yeah i agree and like i say it's about when thinking about it it's, it's more about deciding what you think is necessary and what you think is sufficient hmm. um i mean there's a lot more to this and i could go into more detail but I mean, it's taken an hour and a half just to get through the definitions and stuff. So once we're clear about the definitions, you could go into more detail about what each definition includes and some of the ideas that certain philosophers put about the ideas. Yeah, I, I think with something like this, though, you, you almost need to, to lay the groundwork and let everyone, myself included, digest it. Um, yeah. I, I think like, just going through this... I understand a lot more. There's certain things that I already knew, but weren't as clear in my head. And there are other bits that were like, oh, okay then. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I pretend I know about that one. <laughs> yeah. I pretend I know about all these, but I don't actually know anything. <laughs> I actually failed and I just used my BA to forge a master's. <laughs> Hence why it said distinction on it. There's no way I could have ever got a distinction. <laughs> ah, that's interesting. Though. I wonder, uh, does, does, uh, I mean, as Manny says, uh, hi, Manny, by the way, uh, he says this topic hey, is difficult. And, yes, <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. It's complicated. And one of the things that kind of restricts this is that we only have access to our own consciousness and we're thinking about it in terms of our own experience of consciousness. Yeah. And we do have some science that can help back up certain bits, but as you say, it still uh, doesn't give us that qualitative experience. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and again, it's about figuring out at what point do we consider something as having consciousness. I mean, how exactly do we work that one out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How? Yeah. If you know, how? please write in. <laughs> I mean, like I say, we only have our own experience of what consciousness is like. And if we consider ourselves as the baseline, are we setting that bar too high? Um, because, you know, there, there is still something that it's like to be a baby that has no content to its experiences. It just has the experiences. Yeah. I mean, do we not count them as having consciousness? I mean, they're aware. They have an experience. They have emotions. They see the world a certain way. Yeah. I would consider that consciousness. But, as, you know, when we're talking about consciousness and people talk about babies' consciousness... They will talk about that starting to form around five months old and developing yeah. until they're about three. But they will also say that they become conscious in the womb. So they go through the state of where they're conscious, then they have sentience, and then they start forming their consciousness. <laughs> yeah. So the, the demarcations of all these can be quite difficult to actually figure out. Hmm. Yeah. And I think I think being awake is one of those things that is definitely necessary, but we could say it probably isn't the only thing that is necessary because we can say that having a brain is also something else that is necessary because in that regard, jellyfish are awake, but they don't have a brain. <laughs> so yeah, there are two things that I would say are necessary then, being awake and having a brain. And from there, there's the rest of the spectrum or states, however you want to put it in your head. I find yeah. spectrums easy for me to, to work out. I don't know why. Yeah. Whatever makes it easier for you to understand is the sort of language that you should go with, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. It sort of is all saying the same thing anyway. It's all transferable back. Whether you regard it as a, you know, a spectrum where you're filling up a bar like filling a jug of water with how much consciousness something has or you're going well no if you have this 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 it's this type of consciousness and you have this 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 it's that type of consciousness 
I yeah. suppose it's much of a muchness, really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it in terms of, like, what makes a car. I mean, we call a toy car still a, t a car. We still refer to it as a car because it has four wheels. It has a particular shape. Um, but generally, we would also think a car has an engine. So it's what properties go to into what defining it as certain types of consciousness yeah and equally if we had a um a tiny model that was a full car absolutely everything so you've you've got your ford fiesta but it's just this big it's fully operational has a petrol engine etc uh it would we'd still regard it as a toy car because of its size because it wasn't usable yeah, so, but it's still a car. It, it has all the properties of a car, apart yeah. from people being able to get in it and being able to use it to transport them places. Yeah. Which is probably the key thing that makes it not... Uh, uh, which makes it a toy, obviously. So if, if people yeah. can actually transport, then it makes it not a toy. But then if we had a version of a car that was fully sized, but it was automatic, but had no room for passengers, would we still regard it as a car? It, just a giant remote control car, which had, you know, no room for people because of all the electronics in it. It would still be a car. It wouldn't be a toy car, would it? But would we regard it as a, a car because it can't a transport? Car car. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nope. When we speak of it, we have this sort of basic idea of what we mean, even if it's ill-defined. Yeah. And it encompasses a kind of family resemblance. All these things have a kind of family resemblance to each other. A car and that's what counts them in yeah, and that's what counts them in the category. So there there's certain properties that are sufficient for us to be able to consider it to be in that family. Yep. But then there's the additional functionality that would then categorize it further. So you've got your larger category of car, and then you'll have subcategories of toy car and experimental car and transport car. And and most cars would generally be, when we talk about a car without qualifying, it would be that transport-based car for humans. Yeah. So, it, like, this is why consciousness is difficult. Because are these all just family resemblances? Are they not even in the family? Are we being too lenient? Are we being too strict? So that's why it's hard to think about consciousness. Um, I've still got a couple more slides, a little bit more bonus content, because I've, I've added a few more on just in case the other ones took, you know, we got through them quickly. So when we're explaining consciousness, there's a few problems that we have. Um, and we can we consider these the problems of consciousness. Now, David Chalmers, he came he coined the term the hard problem of consciousness. And we can sort of split the problems of consciousness into two categories, like it says here, the easy problem of consciousness and the hard problem of consciousness. Like easy problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, these are the easy problems. The ability to perceive and react to the stimuli of our environment. The ability for our cognitive system to integrate information. The ability to report mental states. The ability to access internal mental states. The focus of attention. The deliberate control of behavior. The difference between being awake and being asleep. Now, I'm not saying that these are easy to explain and we might not be able to explain all of them especially not yet but it seems likely that we will be able to explain these and even explain them using reductive physicalism or reductive naturalism in that we can bring them down to brain states we can describe the mental states in terms of brain states and we can understand why the brain states create those mental states before we go on, Chess brings up a good point. 
<laughs> it's the is cereal a soup question or is hot dog a sandwich? That's talking yeah. about the categorization. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it is that kind of question. Yeah. <laughs> well played. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the hard problem of consciousness, like I said, it's it's coined by David Chalmers. And it refers to the problem of explaining experience or qualia, not just our visual stimuli being processed or anything like that, but the what it feels like in this, um, what it feels like to drink a cup, a cup of coffee, like what it feels like to hear music, why it moves us, and why it creates certain emotions. These might not necessarily be explainable in terms of reductive physicalism or physical naturalistic reductionism. Looking at the brain states might not give us the answer to why we have the experiences that we do. This is what Chalmers call, calls the hard problem of consciousness. And th this is one of the reasons why not everything might be reducible using naturalistic explanations. That's not necessarily saying that they can't be. It just, there's an explanatory gap between the mental states and the actual feel of the mental states. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Though, yeah. it doesn't mean that we'll never get to, to that that explanation, like a decent explanation. No, 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 no. But that's why it's called the hard problem, because it. this is the difficult question. Now, eliminativists argue that this isn't a problem at all. Um, these experiences, as or qualia, are just illusions. Um, we... There's no sort of phenomenal properties that create these experiences. They're, they come from memories or, you know, it, it, there are other things that can explain why these things feel the, feel the way they do rather than just the experience. But I'll cover these in a future episode. I can't wait. I already and I'll, I'll go deeper into the hard problem of consciousness as well. Yeah, can't wait. Really can't wait. And I think that's the last slide. Yep, that's it. Ah, excellent. No, ah, that was that was and great. That, that went quicker than I thought. Ah, it was really good. Um, if it went quicker than you thought, I'll happily interrupt you more next time. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying well, to I, good I behavior. <laughs> no, no, you were. But I was <laughs> expecting more questions and stuff like that. So. <laughs> But yeah, that, that's it for now. So in in the future, I'll ex I'll like discuss brain state, mental state relationship, and look at what brain states are, mental states are, the difference, multiple realizability, functionalism, physicalism, property dualism, eliminativism, illusionism, and all those kind of things. Yeah, awesome. I can't wait. I can't wait. I feel that you know, fears aside, I, I think I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as long as somebody learned something somewhere, yeah, I'll be quite happy. Uh, well, I, well, I definitely did. So you're already winning there, and hopefully, uh, you guys out there learned something too. Um, <laughs> uh, as Manny says, Dave is saving the solution to all of this for the next episode, not just the next <laughs> episode, the one after next. <laughs> Wait, solution. <laughs> okay, I'm quitting air now. <laughs> yeah, there's no solutions in air. I mean, come on. No. <laughs> They've all been heated up to a state where they're all... Anyway. Uh... <laughs> um. Okay, should I stop sharing the screen? Uh, you can do it. I'll quickly switch to this one. Okay, there we go. And we're back. <laughs> It wasn't letting me uh, 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 cancel the stream from my end. <laughs> Actually, there's one thing I've noticed. When we're streaming and when I've got the cameras going, I lose the ability to c control anything within Discord, so I can't kick people out. I can't do anything. 
um, <laughs> which is really frustrating, <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, Leon says I'm drifting away into unconsciousness because I stayed up too late again, but I still picked up a few things and uh, here and there. Thank you so much, Dave. Ah, uh, um, oh, Philip also says it was very enjoyable, Dave. Thank you. Um, and uh, Chesh also says yay, thank you. And I, I too uh, say thank you. Um, I, honestly, okay. I uh, it it as I was saying earlier, it's help helped. Put more ducks in a row there's some things there that have been quite unclear in my mind a bit jumbled up that it's just sort of gone ah okay and it's helped me formulate a way to process things in a more effective way and i'm sure i'll sleep on it and they'll probably wake up at about two three in the morning and go ah but dave what about <laughs> and i shall think and think of mary's room Yes. <laughs> and have that effect at Mary's room. Yeah. I mean, I, we talked about Mary's room quite intensely. Um, and from a human perspective, I don't think anything that we discussed necessarily changes Mary room. But if Mary was a goldfish... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, like, you think of it in terms of Mary's experience, like she has a new feel... If there is no such thing as qualia, did she have a, a real, true, new experience? Uh, so in that in that regard, would someone like Dennett actually say, no, she didn't? Yeah. I mean, even Frank Jackson now rejects his idea of epiphenomenalism, and mm. he is a physician. Yeah. Very interesting. If I remember correctly. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just conditioning but i still see mental states as being something slightly above brain states um yeah i don't see them as exactly identical yeah i see them as caused yeah exactly um i, I think like uh uh bearded heretic gave the good example of like your 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 computer what you're seeing on screen none of that is physically there it's all produced by all the electrons but it's not physically there and it's the same with the thoughts in your mind yes okay there might be the causational electrical stuff going on in your brain but the actual picture you see in your brain is not physically there um so on and so forth yeah and i mean one of the things i'll discuss as well is um john Searle's chinese room um i think we've discussed this one in the past where you have a, yeah, you have a room where there's a person who has all the Chinese characters and she uses that to translate stuff into English. She doesn't actually know what the Chinese says. She just, you know, translates it using some formula, then hands it back to you. Would you say that that would be the equivalent of a conscious state or processing? Well... That's a complicated one because there's a lot of accent that goes into Chinese as well. But then I don't know how... Oh, there's a writing. Sorry? It's just speaking of written language. Okay. Uh, no, then it's a process. A computer could do it. Yeah. So is consciousness purely functional? Uh, <laughs> ask me okay, after, we'll get into it in the future. Uh, ask me after the next stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Into it when I discuss functionalism. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, speaking of next streams, obviously, uh, Thursday is um, come around to our end of month free for all. Um, so, if you missed the last one, um, it was quite fun. Um, but it's going to be hopefully not quite as mental as last time because <laughs> <laughs> I was fucked by the end of it. That was like an eight hour stream or seven and a half hours. Um, and yeah, it was a, it was a good laugh, but the end of month free for all, um, AMA. So ask me anything. 
uh, Dave and I will be here and obviously everyone who is a regular in our uh, Discord um, can join as well. Um, so all of our regulars have been given sci-fi guest status and uh, they will be allowed to join um, on on the day. Um, and basically there is no real direction. It's basically just having a laugh. Um, so that will be Thursday around 8 p.m. GMT. That's 3 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully it won't go on quite as long as last time. Um, I think if it does, my wife might divorce me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, she won't really. Um, she'll just make me pay for it for the rest of my life. Um... <laughs> um no, Chess, you're definitely invited. Uh, any of you are invited. All of you are invited. Um, it's just to have a, a, a gentle chat. But we'll probably end it by about midnight, unless no one tells me it gets to midnight. I also don't have, the, you know, all the bottles of bourbon there. Um, so uh, there's there's a very good chance that I'll end up without any drink and just go to bed. <laughs> Days to purchase some. Sorry, you still have two days to purchase some. Yeah, but you need money for that day. <laughs> what if you have a five finger discount? <laughs> There's nowhere around here where you can get away with that. Um... <laughs> no, I don't think anywhere I would. Like to <laughs> I mean, I, I've got, I've got half a bottle of bourbon. So uh, I mean that that's basically how long the stream will last um on on <laughs> on Thursday. It'll last half a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> but yeah, so if anyone's up for that, that'd be brilliant. Um and then uh we'll we'll also see whether we um should do this just once a month or maybe do it every couple of months. Because I don't want it to become a thing that people just are bored of. Um so we'll see how it goes uh, and and see how people feel about that sort of stream. I like the idea of something, um, you know, like less formal. A lot of our, our streams that we do, um, we put a bit of planning into and it's nice to have something that's a bit like, yeah, we don't know what we're going to do. We don't know what we're going to discuss. So there there is that attractive quality to it. But it's also a little bit worrying because you're like, what if no one asks anything? <laughs> uh, oh, shit. I've got to try and make up some questions beforehand, just in case. <laughs> uh, obviously, there'll be some music beforehand. Sorry, Dave, what was that? I'll ask some philosophical ones for you to answer. Oh, don't do that. Otherwise, I'll give you some <laughs> science ones. <laughs> Like, uh, how much wood the woodchuck chuck if woodchuck could chuck with? That's really scientific, isn't it? About four feet. Sorry? They've got about four feet. They've got tiny arms, so they can't <laughs> chuck wood very far. <laughs> but if they could, <laughs> would they? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, being a silly twat aside, um, Hopefully uh, Thursday will be a good one, and then we'll see what happens next week. It depends on if Dave's had a chance over the weekend to prepare, prepare the next Philosophy of Mind. Uh, if not, um, we'll make something up on the day. <laughs> I'll get one done. Awesome. We've also got a couple of articles that have come out. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to check them out, but I've uh, covered off the etymology of atheism and also whether... Non theists are essentially the same as atheists. Um, <laughs> and I think you might enjoy that one. It's it's not particularly in depth. Um, it's just comparing what we mean by a non theist to an atheist and the behaviors that a non theist might demonstrate. And also, certain theists might demonstrate as well. So with certain theists and certain non-theists, are they all essentially behaving as atheists would? And therefore, aren't they all essentially atheists? 
There's obviously a conclusion to that, which you can read on AnswersInReason.com. <laughs> anyway, hopefully I will see all of you on Thursday for the end of month free for all AMA. And you've been watching the Fresh Air Sci-Fi Show. We've been discussing Philosophy of Mind Part 1. And I am Joe. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know if you heard that because it didn't really come through to mind, but he's Dave. <laughs> Dave. 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 <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs>